on the, the liposon stallions, <laughs> how that all set up, uh, how you connected with not only Patton, but Holton. And yeah. Well, that was just another one of those. Uh, we, we always say somebody was at the right time at the right place. Well, I happened to be at the right time, the right place at the right time. Yeah. Colonel Reed sent for me. They had brought in a German prisoner uh, who had given himself up, and he wanted to be interrogated. And Colonel Reed couldn't speak German, so he called for me. Hey, glad you're here. I want you to interpret for me. So I came in. And this was a German captain who had voluntarily surrendered. He belonged to a unit called uh, Dienststelle Ost, Service Station East. That was a code name uh, for a German intelligence unit that was gathering information about the Soviets. And just like we were gathering information about the Germans in our place in the Ardennes. We were in a hunting lodge. They were in a hunting lodge in, in a Bohemian forest about five miles east of us. And we were the front line. Our armored Cavalry Regiment was doing a reconnaissance just outside of Czechoslovakia, Pilsen, mm -hmm. uh, Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, in the, Arde in, in the Bo Bohemian Forest. And this unit had been gathering information about the, uh, the Soviets, and they were afraid the Russians, who were about 10 miles to the east of them, would get to them first and they'd be taken prisoner by the Soviets. And if they find out they've been gathering information, interrogating prisoners about the Soviets, all for their heads. So they wanted to surrender to the Americans. Sure. So we accepted their surrender, and Colonel Reed assigned a GI truck and a jeep, or I had my jeep, uh, to take the truck to this headquarters five miles in the forest. So we went. And I had escort, we arranged a surrender, and the colonel, lieutenant colonel, and the Luftwaffe, uh, Colonel Holters, was my prisoner. And he rode in the jeep with me. And on the way back to our headquarters, he told me about the Lepizano horses. I knew nothing about them, but the Spanish riding school, and he was worried because there was a, a stud farm not very far from where we were. And he was afraid the Russians would get to that stud farm and they'd butcher all those beautiful horses, which were the white lipizanas of Spanish riding school. The mares, this was a stud farm. The stallions were in Austria. They had been evacuated uh, uh, to a, a place called uh, St. St. Martin's im Inkreis, uh, another farm there. But the mares and the foals and some stallions were in this breeding farm, this stud farm. So when I heard that and the story, I said, well, let's go look, check it out. So I, I made a left turn. <laughs> we went about maybe a mile down the road and came to this stud farm and all the foals and there's about 200 these beautiful horses out in the pasture. It was in May, beautiful spring day, and the horses were doing their airs above the ground, which come natural to them, jumping, kicking out the, the, the uh, foals, especially the, uh, the little horses, just uh, really entertaining us. So we were able to send an intelligence report about that. And I reported to Colonel Reed, which is just about a mile away, and he sent uh, a tank company to surround the stud farm, and we moved the horses into Germany out of the reach of the uh, Soviets. And uh, Colonel Potaisky, was the commander of the Spanish Riding School, I was at the stud farm at that time, and that's how I met him. Meanwhile, the stallions performed for the 20th uh, Corps headquarters. Uh, General Walker, I forget his first name, was the commander of uh, the 20th Corps. And he invited General Patton to the farm where the Spanish Riding School stallions had been brought out of uh, Vienna. And they put on a show for General Patton. And then Patton put all Lipizzano horses under the protection of the United States Army, including 
the ones that we had just brought out of Czechoslovakia, the stud farm. So Patton saved the Lipizzaners a stud farm. But an historic remark that he made when he was introduced to the Lipizzaners and told about the <coughs> Spanish riding school where these beautiful horses uh, performed the, the dances and airs above the ground and uh, the, the, all of the different terms that they used. Uh, Patton says, uh, language I, which I won't use, but to quote Patton, uh, he couldn't understand that. Why, oh, oh yes, how many, how many guys did they use to train these horses? And he said, well, there were 58 of them. And he said he couldn't believe it. They used 58 healthy guys to teach horses how to dance instead of putting them in uniform and teaching them to fight. <laughs> and that was a famous patent quote, yeah. which I think I have in my book. You know. Walt Disney did a movie about this. <clears throat> yep, yeah. and the, uh, the dancing, the, the uh, okay. no, the Miracle of the White Stallions. Yeah, the White Stallions. <clears throat> Colonel, uh, Colonel Patysky wrote a book called uh, my, my Dancing White Stallions. And the movie was based on his book. So and you're in the movie. The Disney, Disney movie. So yeah, but the, the interpreter who comes to the colonel to interpret, but in the movie, he tells the colonel that the prisoner told him about a horse farm. And that isn't the way it worked. And the prisoner was actually somebody who told us about the intelligent, about the uh, intelligence station. And as a result of are liberating it and bringing the commanding officer back. And he told me about the stud farm. And then I told Colonel Reed about what we learned. So, But for you, Patton wouldn't have looked so good. They were good. I was, um, you know, I mentioned Patton. Uh, our paths kept crossing during the war, uh, after the war. And he was the military governor of Bavaria. And I, I would go on different missions one of them transporting us, General Warleymont, and we passed Patton on the road. Uh, and this General Warleymont was the deputy chief of operations who planned the defense and the offense, the invasion of the Soviet Union, and the defense for the Normandy, the Normandy invasion. He was the third highest in the German general staff. And he was my prisoner, traveling with me in a jeep. We'd gone to get some documents. And Patton drove by us in, in his staff car with his dog sitting in the back seat, ugly dog. Yeah. And I jumped out of the Jeep and I saluted him. Patton raised his riding crop and, and that was it. But if I had, if Patton had known that the general, a three-star general who had planned the defense of, in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, not the Battle of the Bulge, the Normandy invasion, was actually sitting in my Jeep. That would have been an interesting meeting. Yes. And I probably would have gotten it in the neck for riding around the countryside with three-star German generals. <laughs> and then I attended Patton's funeral yeah. at Christmas, 1946, 45, in Luxembourg. He's buried in Luxembourg. Never dreaming then that 40 years later, I would be the ambassador and go to that, stand at that grave, Lord, uh, hundreds of times in the course of four years. Right. Every time a veterans group came to Luxembourg, they visited the military cemetery. There are 5,074 Americans buried there, all lost in the Battle of the Bulge. And Patton's grave is at the head of the 5,074. We lay a wreath. And we've done that so many times. And my, my log showed that I visited that cemetery officially 69 times in 10 months in 1945. That worked. Well, the 40th anniversary of the end of the war. And veterans groups would come. And they wanted to go visit Patton's grave, and the ambassador would be invited to talk to them. So about two or three times a week, I'd be going out there to give a talk at the Patton's grave. So that's why my book is The Pattern of Circle.